uh, welcome to the proposed circular webinar. I'm really excited to, to welcome you today. And uh, today we will discuss uh, the, uh, the recent packaging and packaging waste regulation and discuss the proven systemic and technological solutions that enable transitioning to a circular economy and uh, meeting the requirements of the, the regulation and the marketplace. And um, this, uh, we have uh, a webinar is organized in collaboration uh, with um, our colleagues at Tomra. And uh, before I will introduce you to our speakers and uh, the moderator, I wanted to, uh, to show around the platform, for, especially for those as important who are here for the first time. So at, on this platform at the right bottom side, you will see four different tabs and it's a chat where everyone can, I would actually start maybe asking you now to say hello, you know, to say where you are participating during this webinar from. And um, we also have a poll tab. We've prepared uh, two exciting polls for you today, which I will uh, mention it about, uh, about it a bit later. And you can see who is joining us during this webinar uh, as well. And the most important one is the questions tab. As you can see, this is where the, um, uh, we will read, uh, we will address uh, the questions to our speakers from today. So please make sure that you put all your questions in the questions tab. And uh, we, I can see that 130 people already joining this webinar and I can see different uh, a representation of different stakeholders uh, from across the value chain. So uh, maybe I can start um, uh, just to learn more about our audience today. I would like to publish the first poll. Uh, just give me a second. So it should be um, should be published. So just yeah, take your time to uh, uh, to uh, to reply to um, to this uh, poll question, and uh, we will see. Um, uh, a bit later, who is our is in our audience, and in the next uh, in the next hour, we will have a, a thirty minute presentation, and the rest of the remaining time of this webinar, we will take the questions uh, to our speakers and the presentation. And of course, I would like to encourage everyone to you know to ask questions, to uh, write your comments, and share your thoughts with us today. And please don't forget to put your questions in the questions tab. And uh, the most important thing that we receive lots of questions always from our audience is that straight after this webinar, uh, everyone who's registered for this webinar will receive the video link to the video recording and the presentation in PDF after this webinar. So let me just now see maybe the results uh, just briefly who is in our uh, audience today so far. So we, we can, I can see that 25% voted is the packaging material supplier and the same percentage it's other so maybe uh, maybe we can ask our audience to specify in the chat because it's a quite big percentage and i can see that uh, even oh now it's changing very quickly so we have 14 percent from waste management sector and the same 14 uh, percent from ngos uh, and consumer group and uh, yes, uh, consultants, uh, 30, 13%, uh, and the rest is uh, three, four percent and one representatives of packaging manufacturers, plant owners uh, from government and public sector and academia. So thank you very much everyone for uh, participating in the poll. And now, I, want, I would like to introduce you, very excited to introduce you to our moderator today, is Emmanuel Katrakis, who serves as a Secretary General of the European Recycling Industries Confederation since 2014. And Emmanuel is responsible for the continuous development of the Confederation, which represents today through its member federations more than five and a half thousand recycling businesses across Europe processing different waste streams. And the Confederation gathers, among others, ELV recyclers, uh, though it's European Shredder Group focusing on the various stages of car recycling. So 
uh, Emmanuel's priority are, um, are raising awareness uh, about the instrumental role played by recycling in sustainable development and fostering recycling friendly policy measures. So Emmanuel, I'm passing the, the virtual microphone to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon. And indeed, I'm uh, leading Yurik, but today I will be acting as a moderator, not uh, convey the voice of, of the recycling industry, but acting uh, to moderate an excellent debate on a very timely topic, which is the revision of the Packaging and Package Waste Directive into regulation with a proposal where that was uh, published by the European Commission uh, recently at the end of uh, 2022. And to do that, uh, I will have the pleasure to uh, basically pass the floor to both uh, Biljana Ignatova and Jakob Ragnarhauk uh, from, from Tomra. And uh, before doing that, I'm obviously going to, to introduce them, uh, starting with, uh, with Biljana. Biljana has been the Vice President of Public Affairs of Tomra for now uh, quite some time. You've been working and advocating and advising on effective policies to accelerate the transitions towards a circular economy. You, are, uh, you have been also working and you keep working with various stakeholders, including policymakers, business association, NGOs, media, research companies, basically all the uh, stakeholders with whom we usually work in, in Brussels to, to advocate the, the, the role and the solutions that Tombra does propose. You've been working previously in a European association on sustainable resource management to develop localized strategies and capacity building for public authorities, as well as uh, with the European Commission in Brussels, where you focused on um, environmental taxation. So, Viliana, you hold a master's degree in environmental management and policy from the Lund University in Sweden and a master's degree in European economic studies from the Free University of uh, Brussels. Uh, before kicking start, kick starting the presentation, I will also introduce uh, Jakob. Jakob, you have devoted 24 years of your remarkable career in the promotion of collection, sorting, recycling concepts to maximize resource productivity and to contribute to a more circular future. You joined Tomra in 1998, so for now quite some time indeed, where you hold a number of managerial positions across the globe since you've been traveling to China, where basically you, you helped to, to cement Tomra organization with uh, China. You, you also worked um, uh, in promoting recycling and deposit solutions in Norway and the United States. And thanks to your uh, dedication and persistence, the, the ROF built the world's first fully automated waste sorting facility in Norway, a facility that was acknowledged at that time as a pilot by administration across the, the, the world. In China, you obviously also worked quite a lot in focusing on energy, uh, on basically introducing European municipal waste management and expertise into China. Thanks to your joint efforts with a municipality in Xiamen, Xiamen uh, the built the first country municipal waste sorting plant, which was recognized by the Ministry of Housing and Construction as a national demonstration project. So indeed, you have a multifaceted uh, expertise and experience from different places across the globe. And you are fueled and your commitment is fueled today by and trying to enable a holistic resource system globally that uh, focus on the complete system design to advance the transition towards the circular economy. But uh, once we, and indeed, I think that's a very nice way to, to kickstart. Now we, we see that uh, packaging and package waste uh, directive and the regulation that is being discussed uh, right now is going to have major impacts on, on the market. And so to, to, to basically uh, start the presentation, I wanted to ask uh, Bidiana, what can you tell us about packaging and package waste regulation as it stands today? Sure. Thanks, Emmanuel, for, for the introduction and uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us today. So I will start with, um, with a bit of a background for our diverse and international audience, because I'm aware we have people joining from, from all over the world today. Um, if the Globoc team can put up the presentation, that would be great. It would be just uh, nice to have the visual in front of everyone. Yes, thank you. 
So um, today we'll indeed talk about the packaging and packaging waste directive. This is a piece of EU legislation that has been in place uh, since 1994, so already <laughs> quite some time. And as the name somewhat suggests, um, it lays down the rules for every packaging placed on the EU market in terms of the composition, the characteristics, the nature of the packaging, but also the rules for every packaging waste generated on the territory of the European Union. So this includes, for example, recycling targets for different packaging materials, such as paper, glass, plastics. The packaging directive was last revised in 2018, and this included raising of those recycling targets. Uh, but since then, in a short period of time, uh, the context has further evolved ambitions towards circularity, towards circularity uh, towards sustainability also at the political level have further increased and this has triggered yet another revision of the packaging directive which has been ongoing since um, mid 2020 um, and um, a revised proposal proposal for a revised directive was released as Emmanuel mentioned at the end of last year um, and this proposal also turns the existing uh, directive into a regulation, which is a much stronger piece of legislation in the sense that it applies directly in member states and it creates direct obligations on economic operators. So it would ensure a more uniform implementation of the rules um, in the 27 countries that are members of the European Union. So this is how we come up to, to this uh, abbreviation of PPWR. So the new um, packaging and pa packaging waste regulation proposal has three main high level objectives in mind. It aims to reduce and prevent the generation of packaging waste. It aims to boost reuse and refuel of packaging and also to boost closed loop recycling, uh, thereby reducing the need for primary natural resources. It's important to note that at this stage, this is only a legislative proposal, it's not a final law. So according to the procedures, um, the proposal which was done by the European Commission, so that's the institution which is in charge of drafting EU legislation, the proposal will now go to the European Parliament and the Council. These are two institutions representing the voices of the European people and, and the voices of the member states. So the two will negotiate and decide on the final text of what is going to then become an official final law. And this process usually takes around 12 to 18 months. So if it goes as usual, we can expect, uh, we can expect the final legal text early next year. And, and then the regulation will start creating obligations uh, 12 months after, uh, which means sometime in 2025. But those which, which know the EU bubble uh, know that there are some complications and some questions on the timing. We can maybe address those later uh, in the session. And so, Biljana, what does it mean for, for the marketplace? Yes, so with this proposal, First, some elements of it are just building on or strengthening already existing requirements from the previous, or I should say the current directive. So, for example, if I take here the increased emphasis on separate collection, this has been existing for years already, but now the proposal includes an explicit requirement to put in place separate collection for all packaging waste. And even the proposal goes further with a specific requirement to introduce deposit return systems as the ultimate form of separate collection for concrete packaging types. So in this case, plastic beverage bottles and, and metal cans. And the rationale there uh, being that deposit systems have proven most effective way to achieve high collection rates for those specific packaging types and also a, a gateway uh, for increased circularity and, and closed loop recycling. So this is one of the objectives um, of the proposal. Another example that, that is being strengthened are provisions related to extended producer responsibility. Um, 
provisions that have existed before but now are being strengthened and are made more specific for packaging. Um, for example, rules on eco-modulation. That means that the fees producers need to pay for the packaging need to be closely linked to the characteristics and in particular to the degree of recyclability of, of their packaging. Um, but that being said, also some elements within the proposal remain the same, um, such as the recycling targets I mentioned previously, as they were already revised and raised in 2018, and they're still considered uh, to be ambitious enough. Maybe to, to illustrate here, it is estimated um, that today the average plastic packaging recycling rate in the EU is around 40% or even a bit below. And the targets for 2025, so two years from now, are set at 50%. And they then increase to 55% in 2030. So we are aware that this will be hard to reach um, as, as it stands today. Thanks. That's that's indeed that sounds ambitious. And uh, now, Jacob, turning to you, would it be at all possible to meet uh, these uh, recycling targets? Thank you, Manuel. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for uh, that question. Um, the short answer, I believe, is yes. Because even though we are, you know, on a national level um, in the EU far away from reaching the target, especially the 2030 target, there are examples of efficient waste management systems running at scale today. And we have mapped out this system. Um, and we have also modulated what will happen if we globally did what the best municipalities are doing today. And this indicates a potential of saving close to 3 billion tons of CO2 emissions uh, in 2030, yearly savings. Yearly savings equal to uh, removing 600 million passenger cars from the road. Uh, and what we, so what does this system look like? And uh, basically what we have seen is that all the municipalities that do it the best, they have certain things in, in common. They have a holistic approach to waste management. They are committed to high recycling target, and they are running under uh, extended producer responsibility scheme. Further, what they have is that they're utilizing three core elements. They all have a deposit return system for beverage containers. This includes plastic, metal, and often glass. Further, they have source separation and separate collection of organic or paper or glass of textiles of hazardous and often of plastic. And that these two elements are, are part of an effective system is maybe not a big surprise to, to the general audience, but maybe a bit surprising is the effect that mixed waste sorting has on this performing. So mixed waste sorting is the third element and the crucial element to be among the best municipalities when it comes to recycling rate and, and carbon efficiency. Mixed waste sorting is the principle of sorting what is often considered the residual waste, the black bin. To sort this for additional capturing of lost recyclables that are lost to the source separation system. And sorting them out before the real residual waste go to incineration or landfill. So successful implementation of these systems in combination with upstream treatments, upstream measures, um, the recycling targets for 2030 uh, could well be uh, achieved uh, and maybe even exceeded. Thank you. And, and you said that these systems already exist. Where can we find examples uh, of them today? Uh, you find mixed waste sorting so uh, in in many countries uh, today i'll focus on that because that is maybe what is um, um, yeah the least known part of it uh, separate source separation and and deposit systems work uh, in many countries um, but mixed waste sorting um, exist in also in many countries maybe not so known and we at tomra we have machines at more than 300 mixed waste sorting plants 
uh, recovering recyclable uh, before final disposal of the waste today. So countries like the Netherlands, like Sweden, Poland, Greece, Spain, Cyprus, and more has mixed waste sorting uh, plants running today. But uh, let me show you a little bit about the situation in, in Norway. Because in 2019, Deloitte presented uh, a report where they have mapped out recycling rates for plastic packaging in Norway for different municipalities. And in Norway, there is a big variety among the approaches the different municipalities take. Some are using what they call an OptiBag system. This is source separation where you take your source separated waste and put them in special colored bags that are handed out by uh, the government. Um, you tie a knot on this bag so plastic will have one color, organic will have another color and so on. You put it in one bin. This is transported to a centralized facility where the different colored bags are, are sorted. This system has a performance in terms of recycling rent per, per, per inhabitant of about three to four kg. If you take another approach, which I used in many uh, municipalities, that's the drop-off system. So you bring your source separated material to designated collection points. And this system performs in average with six to seven kg per, per inhabitant. If you have pickup of the source separated recyclables at your home, the average performance is seven to eight kg. But for mixed waste sorting plants, you have an average of 17 to 18 kg of plastic packaging recycled per inhabitant. So this is in other words, two to five times higher than the municipalities that do not use mixed waste sorting. So this has for Norway been quite an eye opener and the industry. Uh, and today uh, the discussion is all around how can we expand mixed waste sorting uh, um, nationally. Uh, as it's uh, widely recognized that only basing it on source separation will not be enough to meet the EU target. But if you allow me a little bit more, I would also like to, because this is um, fresh off the press almost, I would like to mention uh, two new reports that was uh, published this month. The first one is a report from, from Anomia that concludes that there that we need all the three following elements to reach the 55% recycling target by 2030. The following elements they have said are improved recyclability. So that's to design packaging for recycling at scale. The second element is improved separate collection. And the third element are mixed waste sorting. They are claiming all of these are needed. So even if you improve uh, recyclability of plastic. So 90% of the plastic packaging is actually uh, suitable to be recycled at scale. And you combine this with an improved source separation um, collection efficiency up to 75%, which is at par with what Germany is today that has spent 30 years almost on uh, enforcing source separation. Even with that, you will not be able to meet um, the target of 55%. And, and they also look specifically at uh, three high performing uh, countries when it comes to recycling rate for plastic, Belgium, Germany, and, and Sweden. And they say, if they only do these two first elements, yeah, they will be hoovering around the 50% mark, but adding mixed waste sorting on top of that, they, that will move them up to the 60% mark and uh, potentially above. Uh, this report also um, states that perhaps the most important contribution of mixed waste sorting is the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And this is also, I don't know, is that, yeah. Uh, this is also the conclusion from the second report, a report commissioned by the Scottish government uh, that is describing mixed waste sorting as the most feasible and potentially impactful option to reduce greenhouse gas emission from incinerators by removing recyclable material from residual waste. They indicate for different scenarios, a potential reduction in uh, CO2 emissions from 49 to 65%. Uh, 5%. And of course, this comes on top of bringing additional 
benefits to the recycling uh, rates. Okay, so the recycling rates are, can be achieved. Um, what we see is that the EU is, is focusing on promoting uh, source separation. So my question now is, is that correct, Biliana? Yes, yes, that's that's uh, totally true. As as mentioned, now now the new proposal for regulation has an explicit requirement to put in place separate collection for all packaging, and even deposit systems for for certain types of packaging. So I can only emphasize what Jakob said just now that separate collection is key, but what we see is that often it's it's not enough. Uh, we've actually had this. Um, general requirement for separate collection in the EU for different materials like paper, metal, plastic and glass for over 15 years now. <laughs> but we see that it has not been effective or has not been fully effective and not everywhere. So you need all of the three elements of this holistic resource system uh, to ensure that packaging ends up does not that, that no packaging ends up being buried or burned when when it can be recycled instead yeah and enforcement of separate collections is indeed essential so and so now we focus on what has changed what hasn't changed or only built upon in the packaging and packages waste regulation but there is obviously something new right yes for sure for sure there are some new elements and i would even say groundbreaking elements so for one thing uh, the proposal introduces recycled content targets across the board for all packaging containing a plastic part. Uh, those targets are set for 2030 and 2040. They need to be achieved from post-consumer plastic waste per unit of packaging uh, placed on the market. And um, there is a differentiation in how they are set. There are several categories. The first one being single-use plastic beverage bottles, uh, that's actually the green target we have here on the slide, which has, which is, this one is not new. It has existed. It has been set by, by another piece of EU legislation, the single use plastics directive. Um, but now the, the proposed regulation would actually replace the single use plastics directive target and would place it on individual economic operators. And as we see, it will further increase it to, to 65% by, by 2040. And then we have another category of um, contact sensitive packaging. So that's everything that, that as the name suggests, uh, that comes in contact with sensitive applications such as uh, food or, or food for animal consumption or cosmetics or medicines, applications like that. Um, and here we have two subcategories where PT um, is a major component um, and where it is not with, where other polymers are um, make the majority of the packaging and the rationale there is that PT recycling is is mature it's established it's it's quite advanced already so there the target can be higher whereas for for the other polymers uh, this is yet to be developed at, at the same scale um, so the target there is correspondingly lower, but then increasing up to, to 2040. And we have a last category of uh, everything that does not within those uh, that does not fall within those two first uh, categories. So that's uh, one element that that is new and quite comprehensive. Um, specifically when it comes to, to plastic, to packaging containing a plastic part. And then another element that is new is the requirement that all packaging needs to be recyclable. Um, and the oper operationalization of this requirement. Um, so there are two aspects to, to recyclability. The first one is that all packaging uh, should be recyclable by design, by the way it is designed, and this needs to happen by 2030. Um, so it will need to meet a certain design for recycling criteria, which will attribute a recyclability grade from, from very recyclable to less recyclable. And the idea is that uh, with time and as of uh, 2030, the least recyclable packaging will be 
uh, will be out of the market. So that's one aspect of recyclability, to be recyclable by design. And then the other is to make sure that this packaging is also recycled and recyclable in practice. Um, and for that, it needs to be collected, sorted and recycled at scale. And this needs to happen latest by, by 2035. So the details of, of those two provisions uh, will be laid down at a later stage, but the direction is already given, given now in the proposal. So indeed, that, that, makes sense. that makes sense. There is a lot of consistency in, in the different uh, things that have been said. And, and so what, what we see is that we, get, we, we need and we get more material. We sort it, we, we, we recycle it. And there is often, especially in Brussels, the, the question and the issue of the quality of the recyclates and, and the, the fact that chemical recycling can also be presented as a silver bullet. Uh, Jakob, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, I, I think first and foremost, when it comes to recycling, uh, we need to strengthen mechanical recycling. There is a huge untapped potential in strengthening high-end mechanical recycling for plastic packaging. Because basically all mono material plastic packaging can be mechanically recycled back into virgin-like quality. And, and traditionally, this has only been the case for PET bottles. Um, but I can mention one, one example uh, where this is about to, to change. And um, it has been proven where well, we have taken a part in cooperation with Borealis and the waste management recycling company, Simmerman. We established an industrial scale demonstration plant that proves that you can reach virgin lag quality for PP, PE, PS, PT trace, and, and even more. Um, and the recyclate for this plant, it reaches the same high quality, independent if the material comes from separate collection systems or if it's been recovered through mixed waste sorting plant. The process and the technology in, in, in the plants is highly advanced, um, in many ways comparable to the processes you find in, in bottle to bottle recycling plants today, but adapted for this material. Uh, and this also shows a quite attractive investment case today in today's market, given that we have high enough volumes. So, for instance, for rigid polyolefins, typically you would need 30 to 40,000 tons per year or more uh, for, for such a plant. Uh, and many of the planned projects in Europe today are aiming for much higher than that, 80, uh, even 100,000 tons capacity and so on. So, so today we have, we have a demand for high quality recycled plastic. That is there. It's higher than the supply. Um, we also have capital investment, uh, capital available for investment. What is really holding us back is the difficulty of securing a stable quality, and mark my word, stable, not high, stable quality, uh, high volume feedstock to justify this investment. Uh, so now I go a bit in circle here, but we should do that in the circular economy because it takes me back to, to the mixed waste sorting. This really represents an opportunity to extract the huge amount of plastics that are going into incineration and, and landfills in Europe today. And this can really be the enabling factor uh, to, to release this investment and where we will see more uh, high-end recycling plants and, and truly boosting the circular economy in, uh, in Europe. Thanks. So, so do we need or not chemical recycling? Uh, uh, yeah, that was the question. Uh, sorry. Um, yes, I think chemical recycling has a key role to play, uh, but more as a complementary element to mechanical uh, recycling. So there will always be some plastic that are difficult or hard to, to recycle mechanically. And this is especially where uh, chemical recycling come in and play an important role. 
Thank you. Just just moving and expanding a bit the scope of the discussion. So if we continue to look at the new uh, packaging and package waste regulation, we see that there is a lot about a lot of talks and a lot about reuse. So I don't know whether Miliana, you can eventually comment a bit more on, on reuse and, and, and refill. Yes, for sure. For sure. That is that is a big topic in, in the new proposal. And actually what we see with with the new proposal is that for the first time it is setting quantitative targets uh, for the top two layers of the waste hierarchy. So on the one hand, indeed, um, the proposal introduces reuse and refill targets for different types of packaging. And this ranges, um, there are different ranges, different categories. Um, from from food and beverage in the takeaway uh, sector so hotels restaurants cafes to to beverages in the retail sector uh, with alcoholic non-alcoholic beverages uh, but also targets on commercial and industrial packaging where actually uh, the targets can go even up to 200 percent i don't have this on on the slide but it's actually in the proposal so that's on one hand and on the other the proposal also sets targets on the prevention of packaging waste so member states will be required to to reduce the quantities of packaging that are generated um, by, by by the population by the citizens as compared the benchmark is 2018 so the targets are then set uh, for 2030 certain percentage um, of packaging waste needs to be generated less than, than what we had in 2018 and then those targets increased increase every every five years up to 2035 and up to 2040 so that's quite of a of a novelty there um, that we have those quantitative targets for the first time being set on those uh, first two layers of, of the waste hierarchy being prevention and, and reuse. And of course, prevention can partly be achieved uh, by reuse. Thank you, Biljana. And uh, when we look again at, at the solutions that, that Toma provide, Toma focused a lot on, on collecting and sorting, not reuse, right? Or, or are you also active in that field? Uh, in fact, uh... We are in, involved in reuse and we have always been involved in reuse models for beverage containers. Actually, Tomra was funded based on the invention of the world's first reverse vending machine. And that was to collect uh, refillable, reusable glass bottles back in 1972. Uh, today, we are going beyond, we are going beyond uh, beverage, uh, reusable or, or refill systems for beverages. So we are committed to contribute to attractive solutions for reusable beyond the plastic bottles, beyond the, the bottles. And, and when we look at the consumption of disposable packages for takeaway in Europe today, it's estimated that we have a consumption of about 200 packages per person. And further, it said that uh, close to 45% of the waste found in the public waste bins by weight is takeaway food packaging. This is a focus area for us. And uh, we target to pilot the first takeaway packaging system this year. And our philosophy and what we believe in is an open managed system. That means one system that is open to all type of restaurants, different packaging formats, and also different packaging suppliers. And the point of doing that is really to harvest uh, the economy of scale benefits um, in the system and also provide uh, simplicity and convenience uh, for the users and the consumers. So we are very happy to you know, get in further discussion with any city authority or restaurant chains or packaging producer or anyone else interested to to discuss reuse models because this is one of the area that we we really want to help and contribute to so we've we've just seen that it's feasible to have high recycling rates high quality and even reuse models but what is missing today to do that in practice 
Yeah, if, if, if that's a question, if we are missing it in practice, well, it's already happening. There are some front runners doing it, but I, I think the question is that we need to, to have this at a large scale, uh, right? It's not enough if individual companies or individual organizations do it here and there. We need to see really a, a system shift there. And for that, from my perspective, regulation and, and policies are essential um, to set the level of ambition, to set a long-term vision and also a clear direction of where everyone needs to go. And, and then this will create also business certainty. It will provide the necessary incentives and will drive investments in that direction so that we make sure we all go together to make this uh, systematic shift and we place the necessary infrastructure in place and, and we go in that direction. So from my perspective, what is what has been missing or what is missing are such clear um, policies, such clear reg regulations that set the direction for everyone. Yeah, and if I can add to that, I think you're touching on, on the key points there. But I think, you know, if you really want to accelerate implementation of effective system, and this is not rocket science, I mean, if we're able to really align financial drivers with high circularity and sustainable performance, um, th this will accelerate. You know, as soon as there will be a decent financial reward of getting plastic out from the landfills, out from the incinerators, um, as well as for using recycled raw material instead of virgin material, uh, for designing durable, uh, reusable and recyclable packaging, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when there is a financial driver there, that's when we, we really will see uh, the shift happening uh, faster. Um, and this is mostly a, a financial problem and it can be solved with financial and policy means, I think. Uh, but it is important that we align both the private sector and the municipal waste authorities, their agendas and, and their targets, because all of the system we talk about here, uh, or, or the total picture here, can only be solved if, if we move to, to, together on this. Um, and, and we see a lot of this alignment here. Um, a chicken and egg problem and you know should i change my packaging into something reusable why does it make sense because 50 60 percent of this is anyway going to incineration and then uh, um, a municipality saying we don't need to sort it out because it's not recyclable you know we need to agree on where we're going to go and then we need to move move together and bring certainty and predictability and this is where the policy really plays a key role and we need that yeah, so um, I think that's uh, indeed a, a nice conclusion to, to sum up the presentation and the views that, that Tomra has uh, just uh, expressed. Um, I know that um, we have a, a second poll which is going to be launched uh, in a very short amount of time. So really please stay tuned and uh, put forward your uh, responses to, to, to that poll that is being launched. And I will, uh, and we will then later on comment. Um, I will continue my role as as a moderator, um, uh, and here, indeed, especially when it comes to the revision of the packaging package waste directive into regulation, uh, there are quite a number of things that uh, the, the recycling industry will also be advocating for, but. First and foremost, I'd like to go for uh, basically some of the questions that were uh, being asked. So uh, just hope that I can see uh, basically, yeah, I had lost a bit the connection, but everything seems to work. So one, one first question is um, about the, the targets for recycled contents. And, uh, where will the amounts be coming from? And especially, do you see problems when it comes to recycled content for, uh, con for, 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 for food content sensitive packaging, basically? Is it realistic or do we need new sorting technologies or, or market based technologies? So I think this question would be primarily uh, basically directed at, at Jacob from, from the technical side of things. 
Um, I don't know whether you want to elaborate on, on especially recycled content for food contact uh, packaging. Yeah, so um, when it comes to food con or what is a contact sensitive uh, packaging and recycling of that, um, I mean, you have PET bottles um, and, and also PS, um, PET and PS, I mean, they have a different characteristics. They are more barrier material. Um, um, and, and there are solutions for the bottles that we might see more solutions coming for mechanical recycling of, of these products might happen. But then on the other hand, you have the polyolefins, which is not a barrier material, which is a totally different challenge. So, I mean, here it's really a matter of what the policies will say and finding policies that are safe, but also compliant with, with the policies. Uh, and I think in general, there are two solutions to drive uh, recycling rate with contact sensitive material and that's uh, one traceability if you can trace the source collect it uh, keep it separate and, and trace uh, the whole source of it knowing that it was originally um, uh, food contact uh, food grade material uh, and then uh, recycled by a certified process that is one one element the element which is uh, also discussed that is using barrier material uh, so you basically are using recycled content in your packaging but it's not in direct contact with the, um, the food itself uh, of course this need to be a type and solution that is not destroying their or hurting or harming the recyclability of the of the packaging for its next next round in in the loop uh, but there are, are uh, ideas about solutions there and then maybe even chemical recycling can play a role here uh, to overcome that so that was the answer uh, some comments on on the food uh, sensitive was there a, did i miss anything no. i think there was an element in the question about how do we get those quantities and i think this is where the hrs uh, comes in yeah so uh quantities uh um, one, one type of quantity is through DRS, right? Uh, deposit return systems. They are extremely efficient on channeling. Typically, they will have collection rate of more than 90%. Germany on top with 98%, right? Bringing uh, the bottles back. Um, that we will in, in the future potentially see expansion of DRS from beverages into other commodities can actually happen and I know in in Norway uh, the scheme operator there is uh, actually talking about and believing this will happen not being specific on what commodities and when but that it will happen uh, and then um, uh, of course when it comes to general volumes um, which is extremely important also for chemical recycling that need big volumes of stable quality. Mixed waste sorting is the one that really can secure these high volumes uh, coming out uh, as um, the landfills, incinerators and so on, they have big volumes. If you start sorting all the plastic in front of them, this can be an enabler to, uh, to drive uh, these solutions. Uh, I think that's, um, I just also wanted before going to, to the questions because there is actually a link between the question and the poll. I see there is a, uh, the question was which aspect of the packaging and packaging waste regulation will have the most impact on the market and businesses. And uh, I must say that the, the, question, the, the question and the, the first response is recycled content targets. This is also the, 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 the point in the proposal for which we get the most questions. Um, uh, that's also something that as a recycler organization we have been supporting and, and we, we also do agree with. Um, but we also see, and that also makes a lot of sense, that the prevention and the reuse and refill targets come just second uh, at 30%. The first one recycled content was nearly at 50 Recyclability requirements at 20%. And others for, I must say, um, all the elements are extremely important. I mean, if you want to be able to, to recycle more packaging, you need to make sure that packaging that is placed on the market today is, is recyclable based on technologies that are mature, uh, state of the art yet, but that are mature. And uh, on the other hand, uh, recycled content has had a, a major impact on driving the demand for uh, air pets over the last uh, years, and, and for sure it will have a major impact as well. So 
Um, I don't know whether Jakob or Biljana, you want to comment on the on the on the polls as I've just done, but what I see is that the, the amount of questions we get on recycled content is also reflecting basically the the, res the responses we got to the question that uh, was asked and responded by the audience. Yeah, well, I, what I what I can comment there is is definitely what what we also um, expected. I mean, I said it. Uh, we see recycled content as as groundbreaking measure to have it like that across the board. I think this needs to be taken from a holistic perspective um, as well, meaning that this is the packaging and packaging waste directive or regulation if if, if this happens. So that's addressing just one sector. Of course, at the EU level, we see the general trend of introducing recycled content requirements across different sectors um, and with the eco-design for sustainable products regulation, we will see this extended for, for textiles, for furniture, for, for other types of materials. And I think that's, that's really important to avoid those market imbalances where where you have requirements on one sector, but you don't have it on the others. And then the sector which is under the requirements, it, it struggles a bit because it needs it needs the recycled content to fulfill the targets, but those materials are maybe pulled by other sectors. So um, I would say, yes, recycled content in the context of the packaging regulation are, are extremely important, but in a holistic view, we should ideally have those for for more sectors um, than just packaging. Um, I'll try to, to pick up a, a few other questions. A number of them are, are highly technical, but one recurring question is how basically uh, recycled content can be measured in an effective manner, um, especially knowing that uh, packaging is a product that is uh, crossing borders within the EU and outside the EU. And, and there is an enforcement issue here to make sure that when we mandate recycled content targets, they are being properly measured and not being cheated upon. So do you have any any, any idea about the infrastructure, about what needs to be done to make sure that we properly measure recycled content? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first here, Popo? Uh, yeah, I can go first. It is not uh, a core focus area for me, so um, I had to say that. But, uh, you know, we recognize that problem. And me living in, in China for many years, you know, it was really a big question whenever you were buying recycled material there can it is it recycled or is it virgin uh, because if you're paying premium price you know they they will find a way or there were players that were finding ways to make extra money by actually not recycling but giving you virgin being sure on the quality and getting price um, but one thing we are involved in and that is again traceability Right, so when when you put up a proper system and you know where it comes from, these uh, larger processing facility where all all the waste um, are being sorted, for instance, um, modern sensor-based sorting technology it gives you a lot of data, and of course these data can also be used to accompany uh, data processing. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, numbers that uh, the process operators are reporting on uh, potentially, right? They can be to undermine how much plastic are you buying? How much are you selling? How much virgin, how much recyclable? And then you can use mass balances for that and uh, probably help to reveal and, and support. So we are not suddenly ending up uh, selling much more recyclable material than we what we're actually producing, for instance. Um, yeah, just a second. Two. Uh, two, two other questions. One, uh, just to, to try to expand a bit, one about reuse. Do you think that reuse food packaging could also be collected with or without deposit at city waste collection site, or will the future be rather in retail and restaurants? Um, I, I know it goes a bit beyond uh, here recycling. It's more a question into the infrastructure. I don't know whether you have any, any take on, on that one. Mm, I would say and, and Jakob can then complete. I would say that for for reusable packaging for was was the question on food specifically. When it's for food, I think that the the infrastructure needs to be dedicated um, for that. You need to have dedicated collection infrastructure and 
and what we see our experience with with deposits on 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 bottles is that a deposit is necessary to to incentivize the the take back and the proper take back to to those collection points right. i think uh, but what what i think is is very important is convenience there and, and we see that from the effectiveness of, of general deposit systems. If you do not have high convenience and a good incentive to actually return um, the bottles, um, the scheme, the recycling rate, the collection rate will drop. And of course, in the reuse scheme, when you are putting more resources into making a durable product, uh, collection rate is going to be absolutely essential to uh, make this um, sustainable and, and compete with overall um, environmental impact compared to single use. Um, so uh, convenience, very key. And then I think we need to analyze exactly what is the situation there and then, right? So in the specific city for the specific products, how can we make it convenient? And I think we need to play on, on think a bit outside the box uh, that we will see um, to consider to uh, if it can be working in parallel with deposit systems on, on bottles, uh, consider to use other infrastructure. Um, all of that I think need to be evaluated. I don't think there is one answer to that. Uh, we try to be as open when we engage there, as open as possible, think as much new. We're very happy for any new ideas, uh, but we need the convenience um, for making this system uh, work. Otherwise, people will not return. High return rate are key. Thanks. Um, I know the time is flying. I just want to eventually pick up one or two final questions. Um, we've been having a debate that has been very uh, Euro-centered, which is normal. We are speaking about the revision of the packaging and packaging waste directive or regulation. Um, what do you think can the EU policies play outside uh, the EU? I mean, um, do you think that is going to have an impact? And if yes, how? And and what would be here your 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 take on on what can EU policies play when it comes to, to impact outside the EU? Mm. Maybe I can start and then hand it over uh, to Jakub, who also has this broader view of the of the UN process, which is now ongoing. But I can just say that historically, the EU is is the block which has been front runner or has has taken decisions first um, in terms of environmental policies it, it has always been quite ambitious and i think in in the packaging waste uh, proposal we have this as well we have those new elements with recycled content targets across across the board with reuse targets with with uh, requirements on recyclability i think this will this will set the example um, an international example. I'm not saying this needs to be replicated everywhere. It, it is not proven yet, but uh, this gives the basis, um, I believe, for discussions also in other parts of the world, of, of the world, uh, based based on the proposal and and the direction we are we are taking here in the EU. I can just uh, resonate with that. You know, I, I see that sustainability uh, emissions plastic pollution, it's really a global, global problem that we solve it uh, or work hard and hopefully solve it in in Europe. It helps us, but it also helps everyone else. Uh, but I have seen it that many are looking to Europe uh, for inspiration, for guidance. Of course, every system needs to be adapted to the local uh, situations, but there are on the right level, there are probably more commonalities in how successful uh, circular uh, waste management is happening in, let's say, India or China and in Europe. If you just lift yourself a little bit up from, you know, the nuts and bolts, you will see that it's the same principle that works. It's high engagement from municipals. Um, it is uh, many of these as aspects, the incentives that drive collection rate, right? We are using deposit in Norway, uh, but you have informal sectors that actually are having resulting in very high collection rate in, in Vietnam. So a lot of similarities. And I think if if we go ahead here and, and as we, we are today uh, leading, uh, we can inspire and guide others to also move in that direction even faster, benefiting them, but also benefiting us. 
and, and, and also for the UN Treaty on Plastic Pollution, which is being negotiated now. Uh, I mean, all the work that is put, all the discussions, definitions that are put into this in Europe, uh, this is really playing um, a strong ground, a basis for further discussion on the global level. So I think it, it's important. Thank you. I think that that's actually a, a perfect conclusion for um, uh, such a, an excellent and very interesting panel discussion. I've tried to stay very neutral as a moderator, um, and and as I mentioned, it was today also an event that Tom organized to 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 basically uh, outline the importance of the revision of the packaging 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 waste regulation in relation to to the work that you are doing. Um, I'd like to thank you very much. Apologies for to to the participants to whom uh, we for for we for, for we, we, I mean to to the questions that have not been answered. And thank you for to the participants for all the questions that were being asked. Uh, so it's not always easy to be frank to uh, to to go through such a huge amount of questions in a short amount of time. A number of them, as I said, are very technical in the show, and actually we. We are doing it as Yuri, but uh, I know Tom uh, also uh, requires a lot of stakeholders' engagement. And uh, because if we want to get it right, if we want to be able to get the, the right responses that can be enforced in practice, that means that we need to work uh, collaboratively, uh, intensively, and make sure that it delivers on the ground. I'm going to to pass on to pass on the floor to 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 use for for the very final words. And again, thank you to to be Jan and Jakob for, 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 for today's presentation. Thank you very much, Manuel. And uh, I also want to, yes, uh, on behalf of the and personally as well, to thank everyone, Manuel, Jakob and Diana for this interesting dis uh, discussion and presentation. Just a few important notes, I think, for our audience to, to remember that after this webinar, we will send an email with the link to video replay. So feel, feel free to rewatch it again and also the presentation uh, that was shared today and uh, the contact details so it's just regarding the questions you know so please feel free to approach our speakers today you know with the questions uh, or maybe if you have some come up with some questions later as well and um, uh, this uh, webinar is organized as part of the uh, go circular conference which will be in in rotterdam on the 19th and the 20th of april and uh, I wanted to uh, mention that colleagues uh, at uh, uh, our colleagues at Tomra will be uh, participating in this event, so we can continue uh, this discussion and uh, asking questions. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, I will hope to see you later and uh, maybe meet in person in Rotterdam. Thank you very much, and uh, bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.